Okay. And I've got the Garcelle. Who's that, Bob? Along with her family, a university fellow, an instructor, and author of a top selling book. In fact, it's a very top selling book. It's known by most all people in the UFO community. Into the French. I think also she authors Taken. Is that right? So you must get these books because I hear strong, good comments by these books. Dr. Turner will tell you all, whereas others, researchers, are reluctant or not acknowledgeable to comment. As a top world-recognized researcher, she has much to offer us on this complex and elusive phenomena. You definitely will not want to miss this. And uh, I'm sure that you're going to get a lot out of Dr. Turner. So right now, without further ado, I will bring on Dr. Carl Turner. Okay. to be whatever they want it to be, and we can do nothing in return. 
when there is a human element involved, there is the opportunity to do something about this. And in this phenomenon, there is very definitely a human element involved. Now, I'm going to get there. I wanted just to start and let you know we're dealing with a real phenomenon I have witnessed repeatedly. have had multiple witnesses with me in some of these instances. And we're going to try to blow the lid off a little bit further off the abduction phenomena as you may have known it to this point. How many of you are pretty well read on the abduction scenario? So I don't need to do a whole lot of background work. <coughs> All right, great. Well, first, you might want to know who I am and why I'm up here to begin with. But the reason I'm up here is because aliens decided that they wanted to mess with my family. And they chose a family that was very happy and active and productive. In 1987, in December, my husband had, this, had a sighting in the daytime of a large spherical metallic craft hanging over the courthouse in the town where we lived in the North Texas area. He couldn't identify what, what, what it was if he was driving the car, so when he came home, he parked the car and walked about half a block up a hill to where we had a view of downtown, which was less than about a mile away. And this object was hanging over the courthouse in the daytime. He watched it, he said, and I wasn't here, I was out delivering Christmas presents because it was right before Christmas. He watched it for maybe five or 10 minutes, no more than that. It never moved, it never changed. He couldn't see wind affected. He couldn't see anything dangling from it like a balloon might have. And he said he finally gave up and turned around to walk home and lo and behold, it was dark. He didn't understand how it got so dark in the five or 10 minutes he was standing there, but he shrugged it off and came home. And when I returned that night, he said, I saw the darndest thing over the courthouse. I wondered what it was. And he told me his description of it. Large, metallic, spheroid, unmoving object. And we said, oh, well, they must be filming a movie in town. Because our town is one where movies have been filmed fairly frequently. Let's look in the newspapers and see what movie they're filming so we can go down and watch them work. That's a fun thing to do. So we looked in the paper that weekend, and there was no mention of a movie nor was there a mention of this large metallic object over the courthouse, and we forgot about it. Not once in our conversations did the term UFO ever come up. We didn't even think of it. It wasn't part of anything we dealt with. We were not prone to this subject. We had not read on this subject. I was a college instructor of English, had been for 10 years. My husband was a computer systems analyst. My son was a graduate student in physics. We were doing a very normal set of activities in our lives, and UFOs were simply not part of that. But when, several months later, stress had taken its toll, unknown caused stress in both of our lives to the extent that we were driven to seek counseling and physical help for some of these symptoms, hypnosis was used with me to help teach me how to relax the symptoms of stress I was having. And when my husband's counselor finally dismissed him and said, I'm sorry, I can't find the cause of your stress, I offered to show him how to do self-hypnosis so he could relax the symptoms he was having, which included blinding headaches, back pain, paralysis and numbness in one leg from the hip all the way down to the foot, partial blindness, nausea, etc. I was having... TMJ symptoms that I had never had. My teeth and jaws were clenching so tight I was deforming the muscles in my face and neck. Again, for no known reason, I was at the point where they were considering surgery to correct this. And we didn't know why we were stressed out. The first night that I taught my husband how to do self-hypnosis so he could relax his symptoms was May 2nd, 1988. When he was sufficiently into a trance, and by the way, he went into it fairly easily, and I've never done hypnosis on anyone. I've only had it done on me a couple of times, but it was an easy process to get into a trance state. I played therapist, and I said, why don't you ask your subconscious to tell you what the cause of your stress is? And he said, okay, and mentally asked his subconscious to show him the cause of his stress. My husband was lying on the couch at this time, prone, and all of a sudden, he let out this, this yelp and literally levitated off the couch in fright. You've heard of jumping in fright? He jumped from a lying position. He said, I see a face. Oh my God, I see a face. And then he saw a gigantic craft. He said, the size of a small city. Just then, the telephone rang. 
Now here's my husband under hypnosis for the first time with someone who's only been in hypnosis a couple of times herself. Suddenly I been talking about this weird, scary face and this gigantic ship in my phone ring. <laughs> now what do you do? I said, hold on, hold on. And I ran to pick up the phone, which was no farther than from here to the wall. I picked up the phone and said, hello. And there was no answer. I said, hello. And there was no answer. And just as I was about to hang up, I started getting screeched at, jabbered at, electronically garbled at by something that sounded very, very angry. This went on for 10 to 15, maybe 20 seconds. I was in stunned response. And then it suddenly went dead and the line was, was gone. I, could, I didn't have time to deal with this. I had a husband on the couch freaking out under hypnosis. So I simply hung up the phone and went back to see if I could bring him out of this trance because we didn't know what was going on. This was the beginning of an odyssey that led me far, far away from the academic community. A couple of months later brought me, fortunately, into contact with Barbara Barclick, whom you heard earlier this afternoon who was gracious enough to take on our situation and help us to investigate what was going on in our lives. And the story of everything that we uncovered in that first year and a half of investigations is, is presented in a book that was published in 1992 by Berkeley called Into the Fringe. If you're interested in the story of what my husband, my son, his fiance, his roommate, and several other family members went through during this literal siege or invasion for about 18 months in our lives, very consciously as well as on the subconscious level, with all sorts of corroborating external evidence, and I recommend you might want to look at the book. Now, it's only a $5 paperback. Most people can find it at a used bookstore, and I told them I really appreciated that because most of my friends were not rich enough to afford those hardback books. So it's at least one of the things that is available if you're interested in the personal account and the heroic work that Barbara did with us to bring us through a time when we were so lost, we did not know what to do. We were followed by unmarked cars. We had lived in the same house for five years with never a helicopter over our house. And beginning at this time, we had almost daily helicopter strafing, sometimes in the middle of the night so loud the windows almost broke from the activity sometimes as many as nine in a day, circling and circling our house. We began to have interference on our telephone calls and never when we were talking about recipes or the family or work, but only when UFOs were the subject of conversation. We began to have tampering with our mail. And my daughter-in-law, future daughter-in-law at that time, who was an ROTC scholarship student and was in the process of getting out of the ROTC because of medical reasons, was at a point where she had to sign up a, a duty request when she graduated. And she was a physicist, uh, studying physics at the time. And she needed to be near her medical specialist for her problem, which would give her only one choice in, of an assignment, which was meteorology. When she went to the ROTC sergeant on the campus and signed that she wanted to be attached to a meteorological base, the sergeant absolutely flipped out and said, you can't do this. You're a physicist. Don't you want to sign up for the R&D work? Don't you want to work on the UFOs and find out what really is going on with them and not what the public thinks? This from a sergeant in the Air Force to my daughter-in-law, who had never mentioned any of our activities to anyone other than us, except on the phone. So that's just a little of the background of why we're here, because at one point before we met Barbara, my husband and I stood holding each other in a kitchen, quaking, shaking, fearful, uncertain of what was going on, and said, we don't know what's going on, but by God, if we ever find out anything about this, we promise to help other people who are in our situations to learn. And we have been doing that ever since. That's why I'm here today, and not in some classroom teaching Beowulf. All right, now then. What are we really dealing with in this alien human abduction agenda is what I want to talk about tonight. And what I have to tell you is that we're in the midst of an extremely serious situation. Those of us in the UFO community have had a failure to communicate to the public at large just how urgent and serious this situation is. And we're working very hard, some of us, to try to correct that lack of communication. 
This is not a matter for philosophical discussion anymore, my friends. This is something that is real, intense, in our faces, in our bedrooms, in our children's lives, in our families' lives. And if you've never had an experience, I can guarantee there's someone you work with or someone in your family or someone in your neighborhood who has, and it's that widespread. If everyone who had had this experience suddenly had a little red light glow above their heads in this country, you would be so shocked to find out not only the number, but the types of people who are subjected to the alien intrusion and who never talk about it. And now you might understand, having talked it yourself, among, among others who haven't had this, you might have found out why they don't talk about it. There is rejection, disbelief, questioning of sanity and credibility, loss of job, loss of marriage, loss of self-confidence, and loss of reality, basically. You have to start from scratch when this intrudes into your life. And the moment you admit it to somebody else, you have to start facing it. So many, many people never admit it. And we can understand why. I'm going to talk at some length about the research I'm reporting on in Taken and also in a book that will be out next month and I'm sorry I don't have it with me right now to show you because I think this is the, probably the most important work I've ever done. It, Barbara and I have worked on this case for over two years. It reports on one man's experiences for 50 years. It's called Masquerade of Angels and I would be very pleased if you drop by my table and pick up a flyer about this book because it will be for sale in December. I hope to have it here when we're not able to get it here in time for this. It's going to upset, I think, quite a few people in the New Age community, but I will tell you now, the man who is the subject of this book is one of the New Age people. He is at the heart of the New Age phenomenon. He was a spiritualist a church founder in Georgia. He is a psychic who's done readings for over 20 years. He is a very well-known psychic in the South. People fly in from all over the world for sessions with this man, and he has proven to me, who's one of the biggest skeptics when it comes to psychic phenomena, that it's real where he's concerned. And this man, who is at the heart of the New Age metaphysical movement, is going to tell you that the masquerade is going on in full force, and you're seeing angels when you should be peeling back the mask. Mm. So I hope you will at least pick up the flyer and have a look at that book, and we will, I will talk a little bit more deeply about Ted's experiences in just a little bit. I think we should look first before we get into the specifics of the research I want to tell you what has happened to this abduction phenomenon in general. And you've read about it, so you're going to follow me very quickly as we go through how this has been a revelation of experience to the UFO community. Some of you have been studying UFOs since the 50s or the 60s, maybe some since the 40s. And you were looking at lights in the sky, you were looking at craft on radar, we've trained, we've had scientists out there trained to measure angles of descent, to test for landing <coughs> traces, trajectories to corroborate witnesses, what color were the lights, what shape was the craft, where did it go, where did it come from, and scientific equipment of every sort has been focused on the UFO phenomenon for 50 years. And many groups like MUFON and others claim that the scientific approach is the only approach we should use, and it's the only way we're going to get answers. And my friends, I can challenge every one of them, and I have to their faces, to tell me after 50 years of scientific investigation, have you learned who these creatures are, where they come from, or why they're here? Is there anyone who has learned this with the scientific approach that you know of? MUFON itself has not been able to give me one reply. I spoke at the MUFON International Symposium this summer and I made the same challenge and all I got was silence. Science is not going to penetrate this. It is not capable as it is now to penetrate what is going on because this is above the three-dimensional scientific paradigm that science holds on to as if it were a holy crusade to not move past it. And we have to move past it if we're going to make any headway. The UFO community resisted the abduction reports more vigorously than anyone in the beginning. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Remember the first few reports? This can't be. Yes, people can see crafts, but certainly they're not seeing anybody in them. They're obviously empty. There's nobody flying them. 
And if anyone claimed to have actually seen an alien or had an encounter, they were immediately written off by the UFO community as being crackpots and loonies. Nobody has encounters. They resisted vigorously. And then pushed by evidence as case after case began to come forward, grumblingly, the UFO community said, okay, maybe there is somebody in those ships. Okay, maybe occasionally one of them might get out of the ship. Maybe every now and then some random witness might accidentally see one of these little creatures out taking the soil samples or picking some flowers or gathering some water from the reservoir, but no, it's not a common event. Even Bud Hopkins, as recently as the early 1980s, was saying, all right, people may be getting abducted at some point, but it only happens once. It's that random and rare. There was no idea, even among the leading researcher in the field, that it was a recurrent situation. He would accept one report, but if the person said they came back, he'd say, out of the office. Because that was where the research stood. It was conservative, it was resistant to change, and Bud is the first to admit he was pushed to change by the evidence, and he waited until it was overwhelming before he would change. There are some people who have been forced to change much faster, Ms. Barclay being one of these because of living in the center of an invasion area during the, the, the mid-80s when things changed, and we're going to talk about when things changed and why they changed. Now, David Jacobs has said recently that as far as his research with Bud and others has shown, the activity really began around 1900. And we know from some of our own research that the abduction phenomena has, a, has affected families going back four generations, and that would be around the turn of the century. In my husband's family, for example, his grandmother had an encounter with non-human entity that led her off into a swampy area where there was a period of missing time before she was returned when she was only five years old. That was 1903. So if you think it's new, if you think it's something the media has spread, you start looking into the cases and find out how far back it goes in some of these families' generations. I know of an African-American family in East Texas that has had it going on since the early 1900s, and it's still going on today with that same family. Three to four generations is fairly typical. When you get a first abduction report from someone, one of the first things you do is say, let me talk to the rest of your family. And nine times out of ten, other experiences with other family members are going to emerge if you do a thorough investigation. So we know this is not a new phenomenon, that somebody dreamed death out of false memory syndrome, out of close encounters of the third kind, or the movie E.T., or science fiction of the 30s and 40s. It was there before the turn of the century. It is transgenerational. And all the way back to UFO sightings, although they didn't call them UFOs then, missing time episodes, non-human entities, balls of light out in the outside of the house, balls of light in the house, and screen episodes that are very familiar from the most modern reports we've got today. This goes back at least that far. We have reason to think from people like Jacques Vallée and some of the others who've worked into the historical perspective that this has been going on maybe for hundreds of years. Some people like Zechariah Sitchin say maybe it's been going on for thousands of years. I won't disagree with any of them, but I'll tell you this, whatever was going on for those hundreds of thousands of years at a fairly steady level is not going on now at that level. It has changed. Standard operating procedures out the window. What we have now is an explosion since the mid-80s of abduction activity, consciously remembered encounters, multiple witness abduction encounters, UFOs on radar, photo, video, live action. It's performing in many, many areas for many, many witnesses and invading many, many lives. And that was not the case 100 years ago, not the case 500 years ago. Something has changed. And I think we better pay attention to why it's changed now and try to talk about what's behind the change, what's the nature of that change, and how should we feel about it. For the most part, for these hundreds of years, all these encounters were only very consciously remembered, very heavily screened, fairly non-intrusive, and extremely isolated. That ain't the case now. Not what we know of from the work that's been going on since the early 80s. Now, when did the change start to shift? 
Jacob says around 1900, families all over the globe begin to have this, this phenomenon show up in their lives. Again, though, very isolated, very non-intrusive, just a little bit more numerous. But since the 1940s, you know what's happened, right? We've had accelerated activity, numerous multiple UFO sightings, displays in effect for people, sometimes hundreds of people at once, and increased global communications has made it very widely known around the planet. We now have a way to talk to each other very quickly on this globe where we didn't in 1900 or 1800. We get reports from remote villages in South Africa, from remote villages in Mongolia, from remote villages in India, from remote villages in the Arctic Circle. We know it's going on globally at an ever-increasing rate because we have now that communication that lets us know. Now, that started in the 40s. Before 1947, before Roswell, by the way, but that seemed to be one of those trigger points that everybody can hold on to. What happened in the 50s, early 1950s, UFO historians? What happened then? Contactee cases. Do you remember reading about the early contactees in the early 50s? Beautiful, human-looking aliens were coming down from Venus and from Mars and from Mercury, and they were having wonderful contacts with humans saying, you're special, you're chosen, we have a mission for you, you're going to tell people about us, you're going to be one of those who takes the lead. All right, and these people believed it, of course. And they proclaimed to the world, my friends, the Space Brothers are down here, they've given me a message for humanity, you must listen, you must follow. Here's the prediction they're making, it's gonna happen. And time after time after time, these believing, well-intentioned contactees were led to make utter fools of themselves, acting on the predictions of aliens who then cut them and left them to hang on their own. Now, we didn't have abduction reports. We had wonderful contact encounters. That's what went on in the 50s that you knew about. You might have heard one or two other little incidents that weren't quite so wonderful, like the Kelly, uh, Hopkinsville siege of the farm where creatures who came onto the property provoked gunfire response from the family under siege. This was not a wonderful Space Brother encounter. You might have heard about that. Or you might have heard about in 1957 down in South America that the young farmer who was taken aboard the craft was forced to have sex with someone who couldn't communicate to him very well. Yes, Antonio Villas Boas had this encounter. Wasn't a wonderful Space Brother message given to him. In fact, they didn't even use telepathy with him. They used sign language. They pointed to the belly, they pointed to the stars, and they took off. So even the aliens had to come up to speed, if, if you will. Yeah, it's right here. All right. That was in the 50s. Okay. All right. And normally, these Space Brothers identified themselves as coming from somewhere familiar, the moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. At that point, they weren't yet up to telling us that they were from the planet Bamlon. That comes later. And these contacts all seem positive and friendly for the most part, except for those couple of little isolated cases I mentioned. And there were some others you probably never heard about that are there in the obscure literature if you care to look. Now, from the mid-50s to the mid-60s, what happened? That's when we started getting the real, quote-unquote, abduction reports. After the Aboas, then we had Betty and Barney Hill. All right, and this one made the news. Somebody, for some reason, tended to give a little credibility. Even Life magazine in 1966 in October covered their story and treated it fairly straightforwardly. And then, as Barbara mentioned, we had, oh, well, Lonnie Zamora in 64, the officer in New Mexico, had the, saw the landed craft, saw the creatures by the craft, was given some credibility before the debunkers, of course, jump in and do their thing. Travis Walton in 75. All right, isolated rare cases that the, the UFO community was grudgingly willing to accept as, yeah, these might have happened. Little did they know it was happening down the street, across the street, <laughs> next door. And little did we who it was happening to know this either because it was kept suppressed, it was kept screened, and we were kept very, very confused about what was going on. I've had conscious encounters since the age of five. Until 1988, I had no context that told me what this all meant. I didn't know what these things were. I just knew they happened. 
And many people whose trigger went off in the mid-80s will tell you the same thing. Yes, there was something in my room at three years old. Yes, there was something when I was 12 years old. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was an angel. I thought it was a ghost. I thought it was my child's imagination. We had them going on, these events, and we didn't know what they were. But by the late 1970s and the early 1980s, that's when the trigger went off. Great numbers of people began to remember their abductions, not only that were going on now, but that had been going on all their lives. And then the debunkers had a field day saying, who's putting these ideas in these people's heads? If you had it at five years old, why didn't you remember it and tell somebody about it? Well, I can here to tell you, as one of the many people who did remember and who did tell their parents about it, we were told, honey, it's just a dream. Nobody believed us, and they had no reason to. And so we quit believing in ourselves. We became self-doubting because we were having experiences that nobody, including us, could accept as real. And the UFO community slowly, by the early 80s, had to start listening to pioneers like Bud and others who were working in this field to bring this information to light and saying, okay, maybe it's going on. I'll tell you, since most encounters are suppressed or screened in our conscious memories, they could be much more numerous even today than we have any idea. We do not know how many times we've been abducted. I've been interviewed in numerous public forums, by television, by radio, in conferences, and people say, how many times have you been abducted? And I had to say, who the heck knows? I sure don't. <laughs> I have signs of abductions many times when I have no memory. <clears throat> we do not know. What we remember is very little, and it is certainly not enough to give an honest answer or upon which to base any theories. But it was at this point that the serious abduction research began. And the reporting of this research in widely read books like Missing Time and Intruders and Communion and so on finally gave the public at large a context, a language in which they could discuss these things. If you don't have a language, you can't talk about it. We finally got a language of terms, of experiences, of validation. And that allowed the public to conceptualize and articulate these events for the first time. And all across the country, people were reading these books and beginning to ask, is that what was happening with me? The trigger. There had to be a trigger. And, these, and the readings triggered even new recollections. And then lo and behold, we weren't remembering things from the past. We were having things last night. It became something not just in our past, but something very, very much in our present. And you all know the rest. Many people sought help on a private level to understand these events. Some went to psychiatrists, some went to psychologists, some went to counselors, and got very little help, by the way, for most of those people. And we became lay investigators because the professionals wouldn't do it. They turned the most important critical situation on this planet, at least at this century, in they refused to take it into their hands and they said, uh-uh, won't touch it, and left it to us. It's like telling a cancer patient, sorry, too scary, you go cure yourself. <laughs> yeah, we're doctors, but we don't want to mess with the hard stuff. And that's the situation still pretty much as it stands today. It's left to each of us to help ourselves and to help each other, and we're not getting professional, organized, official support, recognition, or research. Now, from that lay approach, which is all we had, by the late 1980s, there was a certain picture of the abduction phenomenon that had pretty much coalesced, all right? From what we understood, from what we found at that point, notably, I think Bud Hopkins pr probably articulated that for the most well-known person in the field. And here's what he said. Here's what the research said, legitimately from his angle, with what he had to work with. The abduction agenda held that extraterrestrial entities, that is, beings from some other planet, were visiting Earth on a mission. All right? This mission involved efforts to regenerate their species. And to do so, they needed reproductive material from humans. That was the picture that, that pretty much emerged from the research by the late 1980s. Now, this scenario explains several things. It had a lot going for it. For one thing, it explained why these beings were taking sperm and ova and fetal implants from people. 
right? All right. It also maybe explain why there was an interest in the genetics that ran through many generations of one family. Could explain that. And it could maybe explain why these little gray aliens coming into everybody's bedrooms and cars and places to take them look so feeble and sexless and emotionless and degenerate. Degenerate in the physical term. Why, sure. They're on the downside of their evolution. They're devolving. They need new blood. They need new DNA. That's why they're here. Problem solved. Right? Well, there were some problems with this little scenario. And anyone who used some of their God-given logic to think about it could see what some of these problems were and are. For one thing, how could an alien race procreate with human reproductive material. You take your cat and your chicken and you try to get them to procreate together. Hey, take your cat and your dog and try to get them to procreate together. How could an alien race use our DNA? Problem here. How could that be genetically compatible? And by the way, while we're talking about all these questions, what do all those non-reproductive events people keep reporting have to do with crossbreeding? So there were still some questions this scenario did not answer. All right, so it was forced by the sheer weight of the reports coming in from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people around this planet. It was forced to expand. They said, okay, maybe we didn't understand it all together, right? Maybe we just had part of it, and now we're going to get the rest of it. And what they were forced to face was that this agenda is far more complex than merely a degenerating alien race trying to upgrade their species because it didn't explain what was going on in bedrooms and cars and homes around this planet night after night. Hopkins and Jacobs and others who had held to this crossbreeding scenario as a firmly fixed, limited agenda had to start expanding what they were saying. And soon they were postulating that the aliens were, were also studying human emotion. And they were also studying maybe, well, it appears they're studying human sexuality. And by golly, it looks like they're studying human pleasure and pain responses as well from what the abductees are telling us is going on. And what do these things have to do with crossbreeding? Why do you subject a person to excruciating pain to measure a response in order to crossbreed? Why do you, do you do sexual molestation to a five-year-old to crossbreed? Why are these things happening and what do they have to do with this agenda we felt real confident that we had understood? People were being subjected to terrifying situations, excruciatingly painful procedures, traumatic sexual encounters over which they had no control and for which no acceptable explanation has yet to be given. And to complicate matters, now you don't have it bad enough already, to complicate matters, we've got this increasing number of abductees who aren't abductees anymore, they're contactees. In fact, they're claiming their alien visitors are superior, benevolent, spiritual, sent by God himself or herself, helpful, and here on a mission that has nothing to do with saving their species. Buzz got it wrong. It's not their species here to save. They're here to save our species. Ah, now we understand what they're doing, right? That's why they have to do all these things. They're here to save us. And based on this activity, a whole new age agenda sprang up pretty quickly. For those of you who followed this phenomenon for several years, you know how fast that came up? Real fast. It offered a completely different <clears throat> view of alien encounters. And to this very day, the metaphysically optimistic theory is at war with the original view of this phenomenon. There is a war among the researchers. <coughs> and it's bolstered, bolstered by a lot of other information. For instance, a flood of channeled information coming in claiming that this is the case. People are getting channel material from all over the place. Now, here's where we get anthrax from the planet Vanlon coming in, telling us what's going on, how we've screwed our planet up, how our race is dying, and how they're here on a mission from God to save us, or, conversely, to rescue some of us, the rest of us just don't make the cut, or, conversely, 
to help us elevate to the next level of density so when the planet does its catastrophic thing, we won't feel it, folks. Mm -hmm. Or, conversely, for the resurrection when Jesus returns in the spaceship and we get it all. Yeah. All right? We've had channel material that gives us all the spiritual hype. We've got spectacular healing events, and I know they're real. I've documented some of these, so it's Barbara, so it's others. We've got increased psychic phenomena among many of the contactees, or experiencers, as they like to be called. And we've had all these predictions of why we need alien help, why the Earth is in imminent danger of cataclysmic destruction. Um, it's going to have a pole shift. It's going to go to the next level. It's going to go through nuclear war. It's going to go through ecological disaster that we've caused. All sorts of explanations, none of them are the same, are given to people for why this mission is going on. And they're here as angelic angels to assist our survival and our transition. Sorry, Bud and Dave, you had it wrong. We're not crossbreeding to save us. We're crossbreeding to save you. And challenging both of these theories, of course, has been the vigorous campaign by our friends, the debunkers, who are here to explain the whole phenomenon in a way, don't care what stance you take on it, because after all, they know it's hoaxes, hallucinations, mental disorders, mass hysteria, misperceived night terrors, dreams, hypnagogic and hypnopompic effects, suppressed memories of child abuse, and of course, the newly created convenient excuse of the false memory syndrome. Why, there's no alien, there's no abduction, there's no UFO, honey. You're all just screwed up. <laughs> right? So that's where we stand today. We've got the metaphysical camp, we've got the cross-feeding camp, we've got the debunkers in the center having a field day making fun of folk camp. And us poor abductees are out here saying, if you ask us one-on-one, -on -one, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> All right? The experts are telling us, but we're here, and it's happening, and we don't know what's going on. So in spite of all these arguments and the controversies and the counter-arguments and the outright holy war of conflicting opinions, my friends, the abduction agenda has not only continued, it has exploded in our faces. And since the mid-1980s, there has been a literal invasion of UFO sightings, abductions, cattle mutilations, crop formations, and hot spots all over our country, not to mention the rest of the world. And I'll just list a few you might be familiar with. You want to go where there's UFO activity? Oh, it's close by. You've got it in Gulf Breeze and various other parts of Florida. You can go to Tacoma, Washington and the area around there and find all you want. How about the Virginia-Tennessee border? Got it going on hot and heavy. That too far away? How about Hudson Valley in upstate New York? You can find it there. Want to go out west? Well, head to Colorado to make the cold border. We got plenty for you there. Want to go south? Try the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. Heck, try the Arkansas-Missouri border. If that's not good enough, come on down to Texas. We got it hot and heavy. And if you don't know that this is going on, right now, week after week, on local levels being reported, then you're not getting the information that's available. And by the way, if you'll come by my table, I'll give you an address of something that will give you this information on a monthly basis, delivered to your door from local reports, not only around this country, but around the world, and it's called the UFO News Clipping Service, and it's the one thing I recommend you subscribe to. You get the reports from the horse's mouth that never make it out of their local areas. NBC's not gonna tell you this. But the UFO News Clipping Service has the information, and you can read it on a monthly basis. The one thing I can recommend, worth your money. Now, like I said earlier, it has not been business as usual since the 1980s. Instead of dimly remembered little events, people in massive numbers have had conscious memories of their recent encounters, as well as recovering even more memories of suppressed previous experiences. And this has had the effect, folks, of literally waking up. And I say that loud because some of you are sleeping out there. I see you right now. I'm an old college teacher. I can spot people who are sleeping with their eyes open. Okay? We have been waking up, folks. And we've been waking up to the fact of our involvement with non-human entities, and that awakening has had and continues to have a profound effect on not just us, but the entire society we're living in, and I'm talking globally. And furthermore, these encounters are found to be far more complicated, far more complex, far more confusing than cross-breeding or spiritual vibrational change can ever hope to explain. So 
some of these encounters are reported to be positive experiences. Most abductees, in fact, most abductees have both positive feeling and negative feeling experiences. So don't let anybody sit there and preach to you that if you've had something negative happen, you're a, you're a spiritual Neanderthal and you ask for it. <laughs> that is not the case. Most abductees have both. All right? And that's just without even any investigation. That's what they remember consciously. There have been, I can guarantee you, healings, miraculous level healings performed on abductees. We know of one case in Texas where a woman was in a car accident last year with 14 broken, broken bones resulted from this. She was in a hospital bed at home, unable to move. That's why she had to have a bed in the living room because she couldn't get up and down without help. In the middle of the night, three little gray aliens show up in the bedroom, come over and do something that she's not aware of because they knock her out. And when she comes to, they're gone. And she jumps out up out of that hospital bed, runs to the bedroom and says, honey, honey, they were just here. Well, honey's falling over in a faint, not because the aliens have been there, because this woman with 14 broken bones who can't move is jumping up and down in his doorway. <laughs> and the next day at the doctor, when the x-rays are taken, there's not a broken bone in sight. And that's just one of the kinds of cases I'm talking about that make people believe, hey, they're really here to help us. Well, they healed me. They healed me. It's got to be good. Right? <laughs> well, have any of you ever known a farmer who raised cows? <coughs> Anybody out there? Who does that farmer take care of first, a sick kid or a sick cow? Yeah. Sick cow gets it first, that kid is going to have to recover on his own because that's the crop he's counting on for survival. He gets those cows to the vet right away. And is it because he loves that cow and he wants their spiritual level to move to a higher vibration? <laughs> Trust me, that's not the case. So don't make quick assumptions. Somebody's been healed, therefore it must be an angel doing it. It could have been a really concerned farmer. <laughs> All right. And we have another little problem or two when we start dealing with the positive aspects that most of us people have as we go through this phenomenon. For one thing, we get a lot of spiritual information delivered to us. Spiritual platitudes, spiritual instructions, metaphysical insights, ecological information. Warnings of coming changes, and get ready, folks, they're coming. It's going to be here in 1991. It's going to happen. We've had aliens saying that in 1987, and people got ready. And you know what? 1991's gone. <laughs> and then it was 1993. It's going to happen in August of 1993. You've got three different Pleiadians' words on it, and everybody gets ready and sells all their goods, and they're waiting. And you know what? 1993 is gone. <laughs> and they're still saying the same thing. Man, if they could only get their story straight one time, we could have a little credibility, but they just don't seem to get it straight. And so far, they haven't delivered on their predictions. And if you start basing your actions on getting ready for one of their predictions, can I please have first crack at buying you out at a cheap price? Because <laughs> I plan to be here a little bit longer. Now, I'll tell you something. Not only do we get the spiritual and metaphysical and ecological information delivered to us, not only do we get the healings and the predictions and the coming changes, nobody's stopping to ask, now wait a minute, what did that have to do with the crossbreeding program? And the spiritual side's not saying, now wait a minute, what is it, where is it in the Bible that it says angels do rectal probes on children? <laughs> <laughs> See, somebody's not using their logic, and somebody's working real hard to keep us from being logical about this. And I'm going to talk about why this is the way we're responding. We have been programmed to such a degree that it is really and truly not funny. And I tell you, even though these things are going on and the reports are valid, that you're getting people are telling you the honest truth about what's going on with them, we still don't have anything to really account for or legitimize or excuse or justify the physical and emotional procedures that are traumatic, illness-producing, personality-degenerating, and sometimes lethal in their after effects on us fortunate chosen objectives. For instance, one of the most common sets of problems, and I, can, I, I could give you statistics, but who cares? I'll just tell you what the statistics tell us, that kidney problems, back problems, headache problems, nausea, unexplained rashes, hair loss, 
eye damage, and extremely bad gynecological problems are the common results in many cases of the abduction scenario. Sounds like uh, that cross-feeding program's running into trouble. And to get that spiritual vibration up to the next density, you gotta lose your uterus, sweetie. <laughs> There's some problems we better start thinking about. I'm being funny, but I don't feel funny. I'm telling you now, you have to start thinking. You have to wake up. Somebody get that person back there seamlessly. <laughs> And not only have there been illnesses following this and traumatic breakdowns, there have been illnesses no one to this day in the medical community has been able to explain. And I may call Ms. Barclick up here to witness on some of these. We have some cancers, our alleged cancers, only three months after abductions on a particularly healthy man that could never be explained. The best medical specialist in the country said, this is so rare we haven't even seen a handful of cases in all the history of recorded medical science. And by the way, what's that blue stuff and those scooped out marks on his leg? And he's dead, by the way, when they're doing this autopsy. And this is three months after a wonderful abduction experience at his house. We have another case in South Arkansas where an entire family, a mom, a dad, their grown child, and her husband are abducted, where there's a big flat going on. There was a sighting so numerous that the, the camera crews from the TV stations used to come out and shoot them because they were showing up on schedule. Had an abduction for the entire family and afterwards in this area where many abductions were going on, one of the women who had been abducted began to have her breasts rot off. Rot off. From no known explanation, no doctor could stop nor could identify and I believe there were 20 surgeries at last count to try to repair the damage. And these are just a couple of examples of the fortunate after effects of us chosen <coughs> experiencers. And there have been deaths. There have been deaths that have been predicted and threatened to abductees by the aliens as a means of coercion. And those deaths occurred. And they occurred exactly as the aliens said they would occur. And this can be verified in private for anyone who does not think this is true. The people who are involved in this will not let themselves be identified because they still have other people living who are under threat. Those are the cases nobody wants to hear about and certainly nobody wants to talk about. And before you start believing everything your abductees are telling you, you might want to talk to the survivors of some of these cases. And other detrimental effects, that, such as Barbara talked about earlier today, include severe depression, very strong symptoms of post-traumatic stress, just like any rape or war victim experiences, attempted suicides, <coughs> and successful ones as well among abductees, in fact, among some fairly well-known ones in the last couple of years. In fact, one in Louisiana this summer, or this spring, that was filmed by the TV crew in the town because the man was jumping off a bridge claiming an extraordinary set of family circumstances. His wife was going to leave him. The aliens had been abducting these people for several years, and they weren't that upset about it until he's on the bridge to kill himself, and he does on camera. And the thing is, there were no problems in his marriage. His wife had a, one baby and another on the way, and they were happy. And here he is claiming, my wife's going to leave me. My marriage is over. I'm jumping off the bridge, and he's gone. And that's just one of the suicides just this last year among abductees. Sexual dysfunction is highly common among abductees. Degenerative and self-destructive behavior, such as Barbara talked about with the drug abuse, the alcoholism, the promiscuity, the tendency toward violent and self-violent action. All right, I've got one more hour. I tell you, I'm gonna wrap up real quickly to a break point, and then we're gonna take a little break, and everybody go to the bathroom, have a cigarette, and calm down, and then we'll come back and finish. So what I'm getting up to before I started my specific research report is that neither theory, the New Age or the crossbreeding, adequately explains the alien abduction agenda from the reports that we know are valid. And the abduction research field is in an uproar, and it's all alone in dealing with this situation. Now you might ask, what have our authorities and officials and government been doing about this? Well, to begin answering that question, I want you to remember that we're, I want you to realize something. There has been a revolution that's taken place in our government. And here in the cradle of liberty, I feel like we need to call for another one. 
and I hope by the time we're through here there will be a revolution of some sort in our action and in our lives and in our thinking about this. But there has been a revolution within our government. So that today, a very great part of the power structure that really deals with our situation globally is unknown to you and me. It's not people we vote for. It's not people we recognize on the street. But it's where the power structure stops at the top. And you'll never see it, and I'll never see it. And I'll say this openly. You could elect my dog president. It wouldn't change that power structure. All right? Amen. And we don't know it. We're the ones they're hiding it from. You know what they call us up there among the intelligence community's top levels? We're the sheeple. <laughs> and that's their term for us. We are the sheeple. Now, this revolution in government activities, we may never know the true extent of these activities because the public is not being told. In fact, most of the evidence that keeps things, most of the effort to keep things covert is not aimed at our so-called political enemies. It's aimed at us, the sheeple. They don't, our leaders don't want us to know what's going on. The Russians know. The Chinese know. We don't. That's how it is, folks. They let Russian satellites fly over the most secret bases and take pictures, but if you try to get out to Area 51, watch it. Now, who are they protecting? And even with our limited resources here in the, in the individual private sector that has been trying to deal with this for all these years, we do know a little bit. We know that since 1947, at least, a power structure within the military intelligence inner sanctum has appropriated the UFO phenomenon, has made it its own sphere, and politics below that level has nothing to do with it. I don't think the president knows any more than you and I do, probably less, no matter who the president is at any given time. And this power structure has attempted to manage the relevant information for its own purposes. First, it wanted to control this information until it could manage it. But that never happened. That's how they said it. It never happened. We'll just control it until we understand it and have a handle on it. So tell the folks it never happened. But later, they found out they couldn't get the handle. They couldn't manage it. But here they were having it covered up and having lied and carried out illegal activities to keep it covered up. So what do you do then when you realize you can't get a handle on it? Well, if it can't be managed, you just simply continue to de de deny and debunk. And the attitude has been, we can't stop the UFO sightings. OK. But we can ridicule and frighten the witnesses of these events into silence. All right. Nowadays, it seems, and I'm going to talk about specific <coughs> examples of this, that that power structure within that high level of military intelligence government activity has decided that they can only gather information, they can't control it. And where do you get the best information about what the aliens are doing? Where do you get it? You get it from satellites? You get it from phone surveillance? You get it from abductees the first-hand accounts from the people who are facing it one-on-one, -on -one, and now we have evidence, and I mean really hard evidence, that this power structure's agents are not only doing surveillance on abductees, they are also abducting abductees, interrogating abductees, using drugs and other mind control techniques upon abductees, trying to ask these questions. What do you know about the alien agenda? What are they doing with your family? What have they told you you will be doing? What have they done to put implants in you? What procedures are they carrying out on you? They are asking us questions in a desperate attempt to get the information from us. Now, they could come to my door and ask, can I ask you what's going on? And I would be happy to tell them. I feel very patriotic about this country. If there is a threat and our government is working on it, I will give them the information gladly. But do not take me or my husband in the middle of the night without asking, put us under control, use guns and coercions and threats to try to elicit information, and then use drugs to wipe out the memory of this as much as you can and expect me to cooperate? Sorry. I'll be a patriot, but you're not being the patriot when you do that to me. There is very strong evidence that the government is having to prepare the public in some way with a widespread dissemination of vague knowledge, somewhat legitimate knowledge. Let's mix in a lot of good disinformation with it so they won't get too scared too fast. 
Let's mix the good, the bad, the ugly, and the humorous in the media when we treat this subject so everybody can choose what they want to deal with and won't have to be forced to deal with more than they can handle. And maybe we ought to install some contingency plan for future confrontational scenarios. That's where it stands with our power structure right now. And folks, I'm dry, I need to smoke. I'll be back in 15 minutes and we'll talk about the specifics of this. Okay, Carla. All right, I, I told you I wanted to talk in specific about my research. Once we got the general scenario spelled out, and I think I tried to do that as well as I could in the time I had, so I'm gonna tell you now about the specific findings for why I'm telling you the things I'm telling you, what kind of evidence we have to support this. There are two books currently that report on my specific research, and the first book is the research Barbara Barflick and I have worked on together for over two years, no, no, the second book, I'll get to that one in just a moment. The first book is out now, it's called Taken, Inside the Alien Human Abduction Agenda, and I call it Taken because, honey, we're being taken for a ride in a lot of ways. And this book reports in depth on eight different cases of abductees around the country. For a specific reason, I chose in this book to look at only women's cases because I wanted to make some very close correlations in these reports, and therefore I wanted a very uniform group of abductees for this particular project. But I don't have any feminist agenda. The next book, which will be out next month, is called Masquerade of Angels, and it deals with one man's entire account of abduction, lifelong abduction experiences. So just because this one happens to be all on women doesn't mean I only deal with women's cases. But it gave me a, a homogenous group for comparison purposes. And I'll tell you another reason it's easy to work, easier sometimes to work with female abductees than with male abductees is because so much of this material is very, very intimate and very frightening I think often, more often, for perhaps the male ego than the female ego, and I don't mean that at all derogatorily. There are differences between the, 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 the sexes, we all know that. We have our strengths and we have our weaknesses. And it has been, in this particular case, easier to get the intimate kind of responses for this kind of study from women. And I hope that this will help open up some of the male abductees to be a little more forthcoming on certain areas that they have tended, in some cases, to hold back reporting for instance, in the sexual scenarios, in the loss of control that, is that, that they suffer during these encounters, and so on. Now, if you've read this book, or if you pick it up and read it later, and you see the extraordinarily complex details reported in these events, you may think these are unusual cases, and I want to assure you up front, they are not. They are very representative cases. The reason you may find these unusual is because most of the reports you've read and you've been presented on the abduction phenomena have been very censored and they've been very partial and in many instances they've been carried out by investigators and hypnotists who did not know to look beneath the surface and what you got was a lot of surface reporting and i want to tell you now that that is not where you're going to find the answers there are levels and layers to this phenomenon within the abduction experience of every one of us who's had this happen that are covered by screens and illusions that require very thorough probing to penetrate. What I have tried to show in this book is how complex it is. And toward the back, after you, if you get the eight cases presented very often and very fully in first-person form rather than me telling you, I let the people tell you. And this is based 99% on their conscious recollections, not on hypnotically retrieved information so that the debunkers can say, oh, it was false memory or somebody implanted the idea. This is from their conscious lives, what they live with every day, without hypnosis. And really, that's more representative of what most abductees go through, because most of us don't have anybody to do hypnotic work with us. It's the exception rather than the rule that you find a competent hypnotist that knows how to probe these screened memories. So it does take you inside what it's like to live with this. Now, I want to read you just for a little example 
a page and a half from this book. It's a prologue and it's excerpts from three of these cases at three different times in our recent history. The first is from Indiana and it's in 1954. And this is a quote. This is from the case of Pat. They came in our house and set up equipment in the living room, Pat said. The army men wanted to talk to me the most. Me, an 11-year-old girl with secrets in my head. But the aliens told me I couldn't tell because they said there will be those who will tamper with your mind. And here they were, the tamperers, the army men. Two female doctors set up their gear in the bedroom, for Pat was given an injection. It made me sleepy, she said. And I lay on my mom's bed on some towels, and I told them my story. I even told them, you're in my mom's bedroom where the white glowing ones were. You don't belong here, but they do. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on this 1954 incident in just a moment. Now let's jump 20 years. Let's jump to 1978, Puerto Rico. Two aliens took Beth down a curved hall and threw a door into a different area. It looked like a surgery room, she said, and she became afraid they were going to kill her there. A third entity, holding a black box, moved to a position behind Beth. She could not see what he did, but she felt as if her head was being opened and her brain removed all without any sensation of pain. After she was all put back together again, as she said, a cold liquid was poured over her head. When this procedure was finished, the alien stood in front of her and Beth realized that mentally she was different. Her thoughts about everything were changed and she was filled with new ideas about God and the unity of all life was in the supreme source. This very spiritual moment was followed by a quite physical exam as the aliens took samples of her skin and her hair. A human looking man with a widow's peak hairline entered the room and made a full examination of her body including a gynecological procedure. Then he explained many things telling her that she and other humans had been chosen to carry out certain jobs in the future. Now let's jump to Texas 20 years after that, 1992. And this is the case of Amy. Quote, the masked alien explained that her race had been doing things to humans that they should not be doing, Amy said. She, this alien, and several groups of her race and others wanted to stop the abuse of humans by her race. They were working with certain people on Earth to stop the process. The other humans in the room were ex-pilots, military officials, and other professionals. They were all working together to stop the alien intrusion. She showed me the thing she had pulled out of my neck and said, this implant is embedded deep in the spinal cord. The thing controlled the muscles of the body when activated. It blocked the brain and became the central command of the body. I don't want to remember how or why this thing functions. Now you get three very different, very individualized scenarios from these three reports. But when you look at the totality of what Pat and Beth and Amy and the other five women in this book experienced, as I spell out in a several long page chart of comparison and detail reports, you will see that as an individual, as each of these accounts has been, overall the pattern is extremely consistent. And I'm going to talk about the real nature of this pattern. Not what you've been hearing, not what you've read, but what really is going on in this report. In this book, these eight women come from Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, New York, and Puerto Rico. They ranged in age at the time this research began from age 26 to age 50. None of them knew the other when this began. Three of the women are married, four are divorced, one is widowed, and six of the eight have children. All right. Although there's this highly individual approach to each of these events, 
between what the Pentagon experiences. Here are some of the shared details that we find in common, and all of these, I think, are going to raise some pretty important questions in your mind. First, if you adjust the microphone, your voice is very muffled. Is it? Yeah, I'm sorry. Is not good. How about this? Is that better? You need a little bass in that mix, and I, I, I guess it's the sound guy. You need a little bass, girl. Can you, can you help the sound guy? Yeah, your battery. Your battery is good. Thank you very much. How's everybody talking about that? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Mm. childhood, missing time during the adult phase, consciously recall scenarios both individually and with other people, virtual reality scenarios, and we're going to talk about that and some specifics a little bit later when we get to the second book, Masquerade of Angels especially, and telepathic communications. All of these constitute the kinds of contacts and experiences that abductees report. Just because you don't have them in the room touching your body, but you have them telepathically delivering information, this still is a contact. This is still part of the abduction scenario. And they vary from right in your face to remote communication to unreal, real-seeming events perpetrated mentally upon the abductees. What kind of creatures are we hearing in these reports? What are their descriptions? We get the grays, you know about the little short grays that act like they're robotic or android or insectoid in their actions that don't seem to have individuality. The little workers, and we're going to talk about those to some degree. You get insectoid looking creatures, tall, thin, normally very white, very skinny arms, uh, two to three digits, uh, triangular shaped head with insectoid eyes. I've seen them, my son's seen them, many of you have probably seen them. I've talked to a few people here who've seen them. Reptoids, very robust creatures, normally tall, very um, scaly, smooth in one direction, sticky in the other when you rub over the skin pattern. Um, clawed, webbed, and these guys have teeth, unlike the little grays. Then you get the white, humanoid looking, not human looking, but humanoid looking, tall, thin, white, sometimes with very deeply wrinkled faces with round eyes rather than the slanted eyes. And these, too, have mouths that open. When my husband was 11 months old and was abducted, he was allowed to put his finger in the mouth of one of these creatures. And he said it didn't have teeth. Have teeth. It had spongy, soft tissue, sort of like in a whale's mouth. You get blue humanoid-looking figures very often reported. Not green, necessarily, although those do come up, but more often blue than green. There are numerous reports of things that the abductees describe as dwarves or elves or trolls, very small, sometimes hairy, sometimes big, big-eared creatures. And then there are several varieties of completely human-looking individuals that show up in some of these accounts. Usually they're either blonde and beautiful, what we call the Nordic, the Pleiadian, or they're tall, very commanding, very much in charge, dark-haired humans, with this widow peak hairline. Sometimes it looks artificial. Sometimes it looks even painted on. But nonetheless, those are the two most commonly reported human-looking type of creatures. But other figures turn up, too, in these accounts. And uh, they're probably not what they appear to be at all when you start looking at the evidence. For instance, dead relatives are sometimes involved in these scenarios. And I'll give you one instance from Masquerade of Angels. Ted Rice, who's the subject of the book, was abducted with his grandmother when he was eight years old. <coughs> they were both given a liquid to drink. It very much altered their perceptions and their control. In fact, it acted somewhat as an aphrodisiac, and this has been reported in numerous other cases. The reptoid creatures approached the grandmother and wanted to have a sexual encounter with her. And she said, I don't do that. I've only ever done that with my husband, and my husband's been dead six years, so I don't do that. Within a few minutes, they brought her dead husband into the room. 
and they engaged in sex. And in the middle of the sexual encounter, she realized it wasn't the dead husband at all. But the image was strong enough to convince her in the beginning that it was. <coughs> also, celebrities show up. President Clinton, Michael Jackson, any uh, Ted Danson, Shirley MacLaine. I mean, we've had all sorts of reports of celebrities involved in these abduction experiences, as if the aliens are drawing some image out of the abductee's mind that they think will make that person amenable to what's going on. And even religious figures show up, most commonly Jesus. Now, we're dealing in this country. Maybe if we were in India, Buddha would show up more, or Krishna would show up more. But right here, we get Jesus. And in fact, Pat, the girl whose family was sequestered in 1954, in Indiana after a UFO encounter that abducted her entire family the next day, military personnel showed up, sequestered her family on their farm for five days, and interrogated them with using drugs to do so. 54. At the time this encounter took place with the aliens, Pat and her grandmother were in the same bedroom when, it's, when the little grays started coming in, and they started freaking out. The grandmother especially started saying, oh, Jesus, what's going on? Well, lo and behold, a little blue beam comes through the ceiling, and there's Jesus in the room saying, it's all right, they're with me. Go with them. They're with me. And I asked Pat, I said, what did Jesus look like? And she said, well, he was beautiful. He was tall and handsome and had blue eyes and blonde hair. <laughs> and I said, Pat, have you read your Bible lately? <laughs> I don't think there's much of a chance that Jesus had blue eyes and blonde hair. And like so many other abductees in the same situation, she said, well, this one did. It worked. Grandma went with him. After all, Jesus said, they're with him. Go to it. Now, these improbable figures that we know are not the dead grandmother are Michael Jackson or Jesus himself in these situations are very often part of what we call the virtual reality technology where images can be created and perpetrated that feel absolutely as real as you and I feel right here today. And they are very persuasive when you are already under a control. And the one rule of thumb in the abduction encounter, no matter what you think, no matter what you remember and no matter what you felt, you were under control when it happened. And they controlled how you saw it and how you felt about it and what you remember of it. And when you're in that form of control state, they can make you think Jesus himself is there, or your dead grandmother's there, or President Clinton wants to have sex with you. <laughs> All right? Now then. What are they doing? What kinds of exams and procedures are we getting representative reports about? Besides the things you already know pretty well from the literature, like the taking of skin, the taking of hair, the taking of fingernails and body fluid samples and sperm and ova and fetuses, and this is what you've been told about for the most part goes on. There are other widely reported exams and procedures that I think have very little or nothing to do with crossbreeding our spiritual agenda. For one thing, most every single abductee has what's called a mind scan performed on them. The creature gets right up in your face, the eyes take over control, and you are scanned. In fact, one little girl said, they filmed my soul. Now this is out of the mouths of babes, and we ought to listen to these babes a lot more than we normally tend to do when it comes to this phenomenon. For women, almost every one of the abductees that are female undergo gynecological procedures of various sorts, sometimes painful, sometimes not. But the result and the after effects are that many, many, many abductees, much higher than the national average, suffer from extremely severe gynecological problems after being used by the aliens in these procedures. In fact, we have a report very recently of a 10-year-old girl who just had to have a hysterectomy because of what they had done with her. It's getting younger and younger. There are also many implantations performed on abductees. You've heard about the little BB probes that are put up the nose and go penetrate into here like my husband had when he and his best friend were abducted when they were 12. 
as often or maybe even more often they use behind the eye as you heard with Barbara's presentation today they take the eye out they do the implant behind it put the eye back in they also put them in through the ear most recently they've begun putting them behind the ear into the base of the brain and very often they go into the spine at some point ranging from the base of the neck all the way down to the bottom of the spine all right, what does this have to do with crossbreeding or spiritual elevation, you might wonder, as I do. Many re abductees report the brain surgery, like, like Beth, when they opened her head and took out her brain. This report is as common as the sperm and ova taking, although you don't hear about it as often. And people who have this happen use almost the same phrase, they opened my head and took out my brain. Word for word, I can repeat it on tape after tape, the same scenario. Certain kinds of instruments are repeatedly reported as part of these procedures. You know about the little light bar or light wand that's used to scan over the body. This is very, very common. You know about the little small box, usually a little black box, that's reported in many of these scenarios. We don't know up until this point. Perhaps we know now, but we did not know what this little black box was all about. In Masquerade of Angel, I think you'll find some information that may shed light on what that little black box is all about. And I don't think you're going to be real happy with it, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway if you read the book. A long needle device, sometimes into the brain, sometimes into the abdomen, sometimes into other areas, even into between the toes is reported repeatedly. And then, of course, there's the infamous alien dentist chair. How many of you have been in that? You're in the chair, the equipment pulls down from overhead, and you get the little oh, laser type or razor type or probe type device that is used in any number of areas on the body. These are very similar from report to report to report. Abductees are very frequently given an unknown liquid to drink explanation for what this is about. Sometimes they're given a substance to swallow or to eat with no explanation of what it is. And the results of these liquids and these pills or substances are varying. Sometimes it's dizziness, loss of consciousness, extreme nausea, and sexual stimulation. All of these are frequently reported from these substances we are made to ingest. What are the aliens communicating in these scenarios? Well, very often they don't communicate a darn thing. You're out, you don't get to ask questions, they don't answer any questions, they do this, the procedure and you're back home and that's it. But they do sometimes communicate certain things. Sometimes it's merely directions. Don't be afraid, yeah, sure, don't be afraid. Um, lie still, don't touch certain things. They have told them not to touch aliens, not to touch things on the ship, not to touch the ship itself. Don't touch, these are some of the kinds of directions abductees are given in communications. Many abductees are given certain other kind of communications. You are special. You are chosen. You're the golden child. You have a mission. And they are told this sort of information, that they are selected for some great honor or mission or task. Sometimes the aliens communicate a lot of information about the origin of the human species. And you know what it mostly says? We made you. We altered what you were. We changed you. We own you. You're our product. Sometimes they make a lot of <coughs> statements about the separation of the soul and the body. And they seem to be doing this more and more lately, stressing, don't be so attached to that physical body. It's just a container. It's just a vessel. Why, it's not important. Now, why do you think they would want to downgrade the physical form that God chose to put us in and tell us it's not important? It was important enough for God to make it was important enough that this is how we are born, why do you think they might be stressing, hey, don't be so attached to that body, it's not really important. You might want to think about why that would be something they want us to believe. Very often they deliver warnings about the uh, current terrible condition of the planet or about some impending destruction that we're going to bring on ourselves or that nature is going to bring on the planet and so on. We get a lot of warnings. And then occasionally there's some weird things like certain musical sounds are heard. Our aliens are heard chattering in their own language, which is incomprehensible to the person. They, they talk about it as a bird-type sound or a bumbling, 
buzzing, humming sort of noise that they try to describe, and there's really not a way to do that in human terms. But we sometimes get reports of aliens communicating to each other in a verbal form. All right, now, in, in addition to these exams and procedures that are reported, there's also other kind of activities that abductees report. You probably, some of you here had some of these. Very often, they have teaching or testing sessions with abductees from childhood through adulthood. Um, sometimes, and I have this many, many times reported very specifically, and sometimes in more than one generation in the family, they taught me how to walk through walls. They taught me how to pass through solid objects. They taught me how to use my mind to move objects. They taught me how to affect electrical impulses with my brain. They taught me telekinesis. They taught me levitation. Now, the people are able to perform these things when they're with the aliens, but when they get up the next morning and try to walk through that wall, it doesn't happen. All right. So it seems to only work when you're with the aliens, but they're spending years sometimes teaching people how to pass through solid objects. Um, we do know about the crossbreeding activities. Yes, they take sperm, they take ova, they take fetuses. This is a given, it really does happen, but maybe it's not about crossbreeding, maybe it's about something else. We don't want to talk about that in just a second. We don't, I know we're running short on some time, so I want to get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, often there's an immersion into a pool of liquid that the abductee is forced to inhale, thinking they're going to drown, but they find they can breathe this liquid. Very often they present scenarios or visions of past events in the person's lives or future events on the global scale. They'll show uh, futuristic war scenes or the planet blowing up or the moon exploding or terrible floods or earthquakes or chaos as a future event. And this is used as part of the programming. And they often tell us, you're going to have a job to do when this happens. And finally, there is the great variety of sexual activity that is perpetrated upon abductees. And I'm talking almost every variety of the sex act that you can imagine with aliens, with things we don't even know what they are, and with, from, with abductees among abductees. They may take an abductee from one place and an abductee from another and force them into sexual activity together. They don't know each other. They don't know if that person has AIDS. They don't know what the condition is, but they are forced into sexual activity, and this is repeatedly done. In fact, in one case of here that's so heartbreaking, Lisa, the woman in Alabama, uh, last year was abducted, and there was another man, another abductee, that she was forced to engage in a sexual act with, and the man apologized to her very, very deeply. He said, I'm sorry, they make me do this. They've been taking me since I was a child. I can't help it. I'm sorry. And again, this is reported in many different instances. And I'm not just talking about genital intercourse. I'm talking about a variety of sexual acts, and I'm talking about on people as old as in their 70s and on children as young as three years old. In fact, one, one abductee adult mother of two children who was fairly happy with her sexual activity to a certain point, well, she said it's some of the best sex she ever had, was not at all disturbed that she was repeatedly being forced into these sexual encounters until one morning she gets up and her five-year-old daughter is sexually manipulating the three-year-old daughter. And aghast, she says, what are you doing? She says, mommy, we're just doing what the little doctors do to us when they come in the bedroom at night. Mm. Are they crossbreeding? Are they taking ova from three-year-old children? I have a problem with this. Now, where do these activities take place? Very often, they're right there in your home, in the bedroom, in the living room, in the kitchen, sometimes in the car when you're traveling. Sometimes people are taken aboard what seems to be a, a UFO craft. Very often, they're taken, however, to some facility that is neither in the home nor on the craft. And the reports from people that I call UFO virgins, that is, people who do not study this phenomenon, who very often don't know anybody else has had these things happen, and they wouldn't know Bud Hopkins or John Lear from, from you or me, that's how the little they know, report identical scenarios. And I want to tell you what these include. They very often include what is clearly an underground facility. And in this underground facility, three basic types of activities and setups are reported. 
The first is what appears to be like a military base, and very often there are humans as well as aliens in this facility, where there are craft and there are activities going on such as a base might have going on. The second commonly reported underground facility is one in which apparently scientific research seems to be carried out, including, again, both alien and human workers. <coughs> and the third type is what we've come to call the processing plant. And this, again, often has both human and alien personnel working in it. And in this underground processing plant, what we get reported over and over again is a setup in which human body parts are being processed like chicken or beef. They are being flayed, they are being dismembered, they are being drained of blood, they are sometimes reported stacked up like firewood, sometimes hanging, draining, sometimes going down, being dismembered as they go towards some unknown okay. end facility. I don't make it up, and I don't necessarily believe it's real, but I know that it's what they really put in these people's minds. Whether it's virtual reality or reality, why are they doing it? What is the purpose of such a scenario, either real or imagined? Why would they do this to our people? What does it imply? And these are reported, like I said, from UFO virgins as well as from people who are familiar with this field. Hybrid nursery rooms are very, very often reported, often containers that have liquid and fetuses at various levels of growth that often look partially human, partially alien. Sometimes they're in boxes rather than in containers with liquid. Sometimes they're in nursery settings where they seem to be hybrid toddlers. And then there are the cloning rooms, rooms where fully formed, fully human, but inert bodies are stored, sometimes in coffin-like boxes, sometimes with uh, stored in upright cylinder containers. And they are sometimes identical, like 20 identical female bodies, 20 identical male bodies, and sometimes their bodies are identical to the abductee who is being shown this. In fact, in this book, three of the women were shown clones of their bodies. And what explanations were given for these clones? Well, Pat, remember the one where Jesus beamed in and said, they're with me? Pat was told when she was shown her clone body that it was for the resurrection. Well, haven't you read your Bible? They're going to have a new body at the day of resurrection, and we're the ones in charge of making them. Yeah. Here is yours. You're safe. You've got a resurrection body. Lisa, on the other hand, shown her cloned body, was told that it would be used to replace her if she did not cooperate in what they wanted her to do and nobody would ever know the difference. Which story are we going to buy? Can we buy either story? Have we ever been told the truth on any of this so far? Well, when the stories conflict this much, we have a question with how much truth there may be to this. Well, I, I know we're running out of time. I was going to talk about the external effects, the peripheral effects in the home, which that's, that's all outlined here in the, in the uh, comparative chart. The after effects, I think, are important. What do people report is the after effects. Sleep disorder, stress, post-traumatic stress symptoms, fear, fear of talking about their experiences. In fact, many people experience physical pain when they try to talk about these experiences. And the pain doesn't come from any real body symptom. It comes from a triggering device, either through implant or through suggestion. Shifts in attitudes. People's attitudes change radically. They become more ecologically aware. They become more compassionate. They become more uh, non-traditional in their spiritual and religious views. And many, many times, as Jane, one of the abductees in here, had to say, they foster a mistrust of our government within us. Maybe we ought to be mistrustful, but they certainly work to make us so in many cases. They often become convinced they have a mission to perform. Thank you. Um, they're given certain kinds of dreams. Most notably, three different kinds of dreams are reported over and over again. One dream I, I call from one of the these report the night of lights. And now some of you may have had this dream when the sky is literally filled with UFOs and it's when they're coming now. This dream is very, very, very common among abductees. The second kind of dream. Earthly disasters, great floods, great earthquakes, great cataclysm in which the abductees have a job to do, reported over and over again. 
And the third kind of dream reported frequently is that of a prophetic event. And many, many times abductees dream about certain events that actually do come to pass. Very often they're disaster events. Gynecological problems we've already talked about. Sexual dysfunction is a very common after effect of this. Marital problems rise after this happens. I can't tell you how many abductees in the last two years have gone through divorces when they were happily married before. It is extraordinary the kind of stress on the, on the relationships these people experience as after effects. Degradation. Now, as many people who, have, who realize a spiritual awakening and uprising from the experience, we got the other side where they go through the degradation of their personal lives, as we talked about with the drug abuse, the promiscuity, the self-destructive behavior, the suicidal tendencies. What do we know about human involvement from these reports? Of these eight women, four have been abducted and interrogated by military human personnel. They want to know what's going on just like you and I do, but they're using better technology to try to get their information than you or I have. We have military personnel, medical personnel, scientific research personnel very, very often working with aliens on board craft or in the facilities. We see an increase in helicopter activity over the homes of abductees when they begin dealing with this or having current situations. We get the phone surveillance, we get the uh, mail surveillance, we get people followed, we get people with taps on their wires, people whose homes are broken into and the only thing taken is UFO-related documents, etc. And then, of course, the interrogations like Pat's family went through in 1954 and my husband went through in 1988, and four of the women in this book have experienced at, on military base facilities at the hands of military personnel. So that's what you're going to find spelled out in much greater detail than I can go into in 20 minutes here in Taken. And I hope you'll have a chance to look at that at some point. The book that will be out next month is called Masquerade of Angels. Barbara and I have been working on this for a couple of years now, and it's an ongoing research project. This involves Ted Rice, a man who was born in Alabama, who was born to a very ordinary family. He was a rural cotton patch kid. He grew up in the cotton patch farm area of northern Alabama. But from a very early age, he began to have a series of extremely paranormal events. Before he was even in school, these go back and we go through, in Masquerade of Angels, we go through very thoroughly documented instances of paranormal events in his life. And these things led him, molded the journey he went on in his life, and brought him to where he was a psychic worker, a light worker, if you will, trying through his psychic talents to lead people to understand there's more to this world than we think, that when you die, it's not the end, that we get communications from the dead who've gone on to the other side, and here's proof. I can give you proof through my psychic readings, and Ted did this for 20 years, very happily, very successfully, and believing that he was being guided by spirits with God's blessing to do this work. Now, in 1989, something happened. Ted was in Shreveport, Louisiana at this time, and suddenly he started having experiences that weren't like the old spirit guide contacts he'd been having all these years. In fact, instead of getting communications when he was in, in a awake state with a transmission for you or you or whoever he was doing a reading for, Ted began to have things coming into the house at night, touching his body, making him very nervous and upset and fearful. Little lights of balls of light coming in and floating through the house like probes. Then he began to have communications that he couldn't remember when he would wake up. And the spirits had never worked like this with Ted. When they had a message, they made it clear and he delivered it. All of a sudden, he's getting information put into his brain and when he wakes up, he can't retrieve it. And this is wrecking the poor man's health. If night after night you were being awakened, being touched, being probed, being prodded, being talked to, and then had to get up at 7.30 and go to work, you begin to go downhill. Your health declines, your mental acuity declines, your ability to work declines, and he was finding himself on the edge of a nervous breakdown from this repeated nightly intrusion activity, unlike anything the spirit guides had ever done to this man before. And he finally reached a point of exploding. I mean, he couldn't take this anymore. He even moved. He was in a trailer at the time, in a very nice trailer park in Shreveport. And he thought, well, maybe if he moved to a different spot, this would leave him alone. So he moved his trailer. 
and he set up his trailer, but he was still afraid to stay alone because of all this activity that had been going on and how freaked out he was by it. And he asked a friend to stay with him for a few days after they moved in. The first, it was four nights to make this move and set up everything. And after they finally got it settled, they were just about to relax and sit down, watch a little TV, and get ready for going to bed that night, when all of a sudden, here comes the little blue, blue probe light again. And this time, after he's gone to all the trouble to move and get away from it, Ted lost his temper. He was tired, he was on the edge of breaking up, and here comes this thing again, and he finally screams out, I've had enough. <coughs> You've got to leave me alone. How do you expect me to do my spiritual work when you won't let me get my rest? You keep me up night after night. I'm drained. How can I concentrate? How can I do psychic readings? If you guys don't leave me alone, I'm going to quit doing this work. He said, give me a break. For God's sake, go pick on the neighbors for a change and leave me alone. <laughs> and lo and behold, in the middle of the night, Ted was waking up, abducted out of the house by entities that he had never seen before, taken to a field near the trailer park where he sees other little alien creatures bringing his neighbors. <laughs> and they gather the neighbors on board the craft and say, is this satisfactory? <laughs> At that point, Ted blacks out. When he comes to, he's being delivered via the craft back to the neighborhood and they're dropping off all the neighbors one by one at their house and Ted is the last one. And he gets up the next day and says to his friend who's had staying with him because he's been too nervous to stay alone, you won't believe what happened to me last night. Now, of course, the man didn't believe him. Now, they had just moved into this area. He had not met any of the neighbors. He said, I would think, you know, these beings came in and took me to a spaceship. He said, I think over there past those woods is where they took me to. And the guy said, nah, there's nothing but woods over there. There's nowhere for a UFO to land. He said, yes, there is. I've been there last night. Let's go look. And his friend agrees to go with him, but there comes a sudden downpour. I mean, a downpour. If you've ever been in Louisiana, that's where it knows how to rain. And it was several days before it was dry enough for Ted and his friend to go through the woods and see if there was this place that Ted remembered from his event. And sure enough, there it was, a large field. Now, they didn't see any UFO traces, so they said, ah, maybe it was just a dream. That week, for sale signs begin to go up all up and down Ted's street. <laughs> and within a matter of a very short time, all but two of the original neighbors were gone. Mm -hmm. Now, he had assumed this was only a dream, so he didn't pursue it. Several months later, he gets to know some of the neighbors by then, and he's chatting with them, and there's a couple who are still part of the original, the only two others who were left from the original night, and they're chatting, and one of his friends says, hey, Unsolved Mysteries is coming on. They're going to talk about UFOs. Remember that dream you had? You want to come hear this? Ted says, yeah. And he invites the neighbors who have two little young children in to watch it with him. They watch it. The neighbors get up to leave, and as they're leaving, the woman says, you know, that reminds me. Several months ago, my little daughter told me about the night the spacemen came and took her and everybody in the neighborhood for a ride. And Ted said, can I talk to the little girl? Can I hear from her? And they brought the little girl in, and she recounted the story. And then they remembered that a relative had been visiting that weekend, a teenager sleeping on the couch in the living room. And she said, yeah. And that was the same weekend my cousin said, what were all those little kids doing in the house last night, and where'd that blue light come from? Mm -hmm. So began the investigation into Ted's non-spiritual, non spirit guide abduction events and what came out of this investigation that has gone on now for over two years will literally blow the top off of the metaphysical view of the alien agenda and I exhort you to read it if somebody will give me a grant I'll give you the books for free I think it's that important that you read what we have discovered about what goes on with this agenda, what they're doing with the black box, what they're doing with the cloning, and what they're doing with our souls. And I mean our souls. And I think we're going to find out that we have never yet fully understood what this soul energy is all about. And we're in for a surprise when we find out what can be done with the manipulation of our soul energy by these beings and why they may be doing it. 
And of course, since I do hope you'll look at the book, and I only have two minutes left before we go to question and answer, I cannot go into all of the details. I don't mean to be a tease, but this is a story that would take a week to tell you. But I'll tell you, it starts with one of the New Age prime stars and takes you on a journey that's going to turn you 180 degrees around on what you think is going on with these spirits, these aliens, and this masquerade of angels that so many of us, with our good hearts and our good love, have accepted at face value. And my message to you is, nothing at face value. They can deceive, they can use illusion, they can control how you respond, what you see, what you feel, and what you remember. And if you're going to take any of it at face value, i got a bridge I want to sell you. <laughs> and I thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions and answers at this point. mix of a silicon substance, unidentified. Um, Daryl Sims down in Houston with the Houston UFO Network has, a, has a collected several implants that are being tested. So far, none of them have been positively identified. What we find with a lot of these artifacts is that, yes, they get tested, and the results tell us what they're not, but they don't tell us what they are. And very often, it's made out of very mundane material. But if you're working with terrestrial creatures, you pretty much probably want to use terrestrial materials for dealing with them. That, that seems to make some sense to me. Sometimes these little, like Barbara showed you, did you show the little uh, hip implant, the little bead type thing with the wires? Very often they look like that, a small cylinder with little wires coming out. Some of the ones into the ear, like um, Amy in here had two implants removed, one out of the neck and one out of the ear. The ear implant looks like a plastic pliable material and you can see through it sort of pinkish orange colored and there were little type of wire devices or lines within it but when it was removed and exposed to air it disintegrated and this has happened in another case identical so we don't get a whole lot of analysis from these artifacts they proved to be mundane material or they mysteriously vanish the slag, for instance, that's left off and after a UFO landing, there will be metallic slags left. We've done some testing and other people have done testing on those. They always prove to be very mundane material. Uh, in one case, I tested it with Angie, who has had cattle mutilations and landing trace burns that where things wouldn't grow for a couple of years on the ground as, uh, among her abduction experiences. The bubbly slag stuff proved to be industrial grade aluminum, just like you'd find if you melted a tin can. So we don't learn a lot from the artifacts. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Can aliens reverse death? Reverse death? I mean, we've heard about their heels. Can they bring back people from the dead? Yeah, Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, they may can reproduce the body through cloning, however. And then it looks like the person's back from the dead. Now, whether there's a soul in there or not, something we might want to talk about. Yes, sir. Not a like new well, I'm supposed the to. The implant. Yes, sir. Uh, because it's been reported to be by some and by some of the radiologists that they're uh, using x ray on the implants rather than how you cut them up. Right. And it's been very successful because the x ray explodes some of the contents of these implants. So that if you can get a radiologist to cooperate with you, it, it, it's better sometimes than surgery trying to get that. Well, yeah, surgery. Yeah, so I thought that's, I would like to report that while we were on this. Right. We know of some people who have implants like so close to the optic nerve that they can't be removed without blinding the person. Sometimes in inoperable parts of the brain, they show up on an MRI or other kinds of scans, but they're in places you can't get to without killing the person. Uh, sometimes they are removable in other parts of the body, but even when we get them out, we don't know what they do. Analysis doesn't tell us. So it's sort of a moot question at this point. What are the implants doing? Yes, ma'am. Maybe it was based on reports 
that are based on information that the public needed to know about in a very non-threatening way, so they put it into a fictionalized account. That's often been done with our, they put it in movies, they put it in advertising. Anybody remember the, the last few months, the stovetop stuffing commercial? Yeah. 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 Two little boys are sitting out on the steps, and one of them says, I wonder why moms quit making stovetop stuffing for, for dinner anymore. And the other kid says, Maybe she was abducted by aliens in your place with a mom lookalike. <laughs> and then they go into dinner, and mother says, we've got stovetop stuffing for dinner. And the little boy says, mom, you're back. And she smiles evilly and says, what did you expect, an alien? <laughs> yeah, we get the information out in a number of non-threatening ways. Yes, sir. Turner, do you think that if the government, because of their involvement with UFOs, maybe if they had let the general public know as early as 1947 after the Roswell crash that maybe the public that uh, might be more prepared or you know prone to believe in. Certainly that seems logical to me to prepare people early for something that important but the government's never been logical in its life. Right. Uh, their idea is you keep a lid on it till you have control of it and unfortunately they couldn't get control on it so we're, we're left with the lid and the lid is a whole lot looser and a whole lot heavier now than it used to be. Um, I think one of the things we have to really work on, since they're not going to do it directly, is us educating each other. What can people do about this phenomenon? The first thing they can do is wake up and do their homework, read the material that's out there, connect with the people who are doing the research and having the experiences, educate yourself first, educate your family second, and then take it to the streets and educate your community because you cannot go and demand official recognition or response or action until there is an outcry at a strong enough level that these people are scared enough for their job that they're going to respond to you. Just like in any other political situation, if you want action, you've got to bring pressure, and you can't bring pressure until you've got information. Yes, sir. Is, is that going to make a difference, though? Is that going to stop anything, make any change? We don't know. We don't know, but by golly, we, sh we got to try everything we can. And I think one of the things we could try on the individual level is to raise our awareness through education to a point where we internalize a strong and constant and steady resistance to all things negative. And you've got to recognize something's negative before you get that resistance. All right? So that's where you start. You educate yourself to the facts, and then you decide which ones you want to support and which ones you want to resist, and you make that internal. And you say, but I can't resist. They paralyze me when they come in and take me. Yes, they do, but they don't paralyze your mind. And if you can work to have a constant, vigilant, resistant awareness, you can blast them. We have had people who have hurt them by imagining a bomb going off in their faces. They can't move, but they can think a bomb exploding in their faces. We also need to learn to fight in our dreams because much of the contact they do is internal and it happens during our dream phase when they come in and give us virtual reality dreams, start fighting in the dream. That's where we start is with resistance and that's right now all we got to offer. But we need a response from our government. If we've collected in the private community this much information, my God, think of how much information the governments of this planet have collected with their equipment and their surveillance. And this, above all, is where we need to share an effort. Yes, sir. Have you noticed a pattern of uh, compulsive disorders? Absolutely. The compulsions and obsessions reported by abductees are phenomenally common and phenomenally um, illogical. Yes, and yeah. this seems to be one of those after effects, as much as the sexual dysfunction or the sleep disorder or any of the rest of it. Yes, compulsions that elicit certain very strong damaging emotions, and there is at least one group of these beings who literally harvest the emotional energy. Barbara has called them emotional vampires. I think it's a good term. And they will do what it takes to elicit that kind of emotion in your life so they can feed off of it or they can harvest it. And one of the things we have to learn to do is recognize how they manipulate us so we don't do it. We don't want to give them that. The one emotion they do not like from us is anger directed at them. That's the one they don't want. That's the one we should give them. Yeah. Isn't it a fact that the uh, government is, uh, is working with them? 
Well, we get report after report of government and uh, of human, military, research, scientists, and so on working in facilities with aliens. But do we don't know if they're working voluntarily or if they're under coercion. Right. We don't know because we're right. not in, let in on what the government already knows. If they're working with them and cooperating with them, why in the heck are they taking all these abductees and asking us what we know about it? Right. You don't have to ask what your allies are doing. They're your allies. So we don't know what that's, I'm just telling you what people report. And the number one thing you've got to always remember is that abductees report alien controlled information because our perceptions are under control. We've got to not take it at face value. There are ways through hypnosis and through other methods where you can probe under these screens, under these illusions, but it's not easy and it takes a lot of work and it takes some expertise. So we don't know if they're under coercion to do it, if it's voluntary, but yes, it is reported very frequently. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I was wondering, are there many um, instances where abductees um, actually don't know whether they are abducted or not, but they are catch genes? Yes, there they are. Feel that you, they feel that something strange is happening? Yes. They don't quite know what it is, don't know how to explain it? Absolutely. In fact, most of most abductees have had it since childhood. Sometimes it only starts to surface through dreams. It's a, it stays suppressed until it's triggered. You mentioned something about the black helicopters, black unmarked helicopters. Right. I had read that as early as 84 about the black helicopters that seem to be tailing UFO abductees and uh, UFO researchers that had gotten too close to the truth. And I remember seeing something on uh, hard copy. They were talking about uh, the Escamilla family right. in uh, Roswell. It's, it's you know, a hotbed of UFO activity. You can go on and see UFOs every day there. Basically, they're capturing on videotape. At one point, you see a black helicopter, and it instantly transmutes into a silver disc. Oh yeah, we don't know if these. Some of these, we all, we do know are military. We in fact we have video of them at bases on the ground. Some yeah. of them are, but others can be. For all we know, other kind. Like I said, illusions, screens, deceptions. We've seen them be <laughs> regular planes, helicopters, haystacks, buildings vans, pickups, and then they transform. Arms. Right. So you can't take it face value. This is the lesson. We ought to have learned it a long time ago. We're just sort of thick sometimes. Also, just a comment. This is a little booklet that comes with the new model that the, oh, yeah, the, the Tester, Tester Corporation. Corporation. And they've been 100% yeah. right on things that the government is about to reveal to the public. Yeah, the sport of, model, right? The sport models are right. Um, There was a lady over yeah. here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, in regards to harvesting emotion, I'm a meditator and I often have the Kundalini experience and the experience of transcendence, which I thought was wonderful. It feels great. Yeah. But I wonder also if maybe that is a manipulation. I thought maybe it was like preparing a light, a light body. And also, I'd like you to comment on that and also the theory that we're going from a two strand DNA to a 12 strand DNA. Well, I, I am not equipped to comment on the DNA. I'm not into that uh, end of the research, nor do I have the expertise to study it if I wanted to. I pretty much, you know, got my skills, and then I don't have certain others. But as far as the Kundalini experience, we do know that sexual energy is very, very often one of the things that they take, and there is a relationship because of the chakra from which the Kundalini is released. It may be one of the reasons some of the sexual activities are perpetrated during encounters, because not only do you get the sexual energy, you also get the fear energy that goes along with it when it's a rape-forced scenario. And it may well be they do feed off of this. We know they feed off of fear emotions, so the first thing to do is get over fear, Fear destabilizes you, fear paralyzes you, fear is not a helpful emotion. You may be afraid, but you need to turn it into a more pr productive emotion. And we try to work on turning it around. The one thing they don't like is anger. Take that fear that's hurting you, turn it around and aim it at them, and you may have a little bit more chance of, of having that resistance that we're looking for. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to comment on what you said about back. And um, there was a story about a woman who was being taken by being abducted, and she was very angry, and she was fighting back. She didn't know anything about God, and her priest was like to deal with them, and they were going yeah. to have a hand with that. Well, that, that may be what she consciously remembers. That may not be what really happened. All right? 
Um, that's just what I wanted to always caution you. That's we, we report abducting, rec I mean, alien controlled information. They let us think a lot of nice things. They let us think certain things work. But I have other cases where people have prayed to Jesus and called on Jesus while this was going on, and the aliens have laughed at them. We had a man, well, Ted Rice in Masquerade of Angels was to the point where he was devoutly praying. Most of the time he was awake and not at work. He would go to bed with 11 Bibles on his bed holding a cross, a two-foot-long wooden cross, and it didn't stop a darn thing. And these are people with real faith, not people who are faking it. Um, I'm trying to get everybody a chance. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I want to not discredit because I, I enjoyed listening to both you and Barbara. And you know, thank you for coming. And I, I well, believe everything that you, you have to say. Well, I'm not asking <laughs> you to believe it. I just right. well, you listen. It's a personal thing or whatever. But I'm, I'm hoping tomorrow or somewhere along the lines, because the only abductees I've ever met have been real positive experiences. I'm living with one of them. Right. And I believe, you know, as well as in the United States, I could walk out and somebody will stab me in the back, as well yeah. as somebody will come up and give me a hug where there are extraterrestrials that will come down and give me a hug, and there will be other ones that will come down. Okay, I, I would like to, I think that's an excellent comment, and I'd like to respond to it. First off, we don't know that they're extraterrestrials. Let's, let's be clear on that. We don't know where they come from. They could have been, they could be Earth creatures. We don't know. They could be parallel dimensional creatures. We're assuming extraterrestrial, but we don't know it. There's no way to test it. Secondly, most abductees have both positive and negative feeling ex uh, experiences. Uh, thirdly, most abductees only remember part of what happens to them and sometimes have no memory at all of events so that they may only be allowed to remember the things that will give good PR for their particular group. Fourth, there really are good forces at work in this universe. We have many of us had experiences that prove there is a, there is a positive force trying to help us. But the rule of thumb I think we can use until we have proof otherwise is that yes, good forces may intervene, yes, good forces may prod us in the right direction and give us information, but good forces do not abduct. That is a contradiction in terms. All right? So we are lit. I just wanted to, yes, I've had positive experiences too. Just one other comment that, that popped in my head, and the whole time really that Barbara was talking and, and that you are. I haven't heard anything that either of you have said that isn't what we are doing either to ourselves or to animals or, or anything, you know, to, it's, it just, okay. it seems weird, or a hypocrisy, not saying that you or I or, or whatever. Right, you mean the human but, race. Yeah, the human right. race right. as a whole. I mean, we're giving yeah. a pretty good, clear picture to somebody right. looking at it. Oh, these guys must like cutting each other up and, you know, let's We also have a great deal of hypocrisy on the part of the aliens, too, by the way. Let's not forget that. So maybe that uh, we are kin more than we think. But on the one hand, they accuse us of destroying our planet, and they're going to have to do something to change it. On the other hand, they turn around and say, you are our creation. We made you what you are. You belong to us. Well, they made us what we are, and they made us destroy our planet. Yeah. I mean, you got to have some logic right. when you start listening to what they're saying, because they're very contradictory in, in their communications. And if they and they're here to save our planet, well, they've been down here working in mass very furiously, at least since the 40s, probably since the turn of the century, if not 100 years before. And they've been promising for the last 15 years that we're going, we're all elevating, we're going to this next level, and they're here to make the world a better place. And have you noticed the world getting to be a better place? <laughs> they're very inept if that is their job. <laughs> And they seem to be very stupid if they have to do the same kind of experiments that they are claiming are merely experiments over and over and over again. Somebody, I think it was Daryl Sims, estimated that the average IQ based on the performance of at least the ones that come in and do most of the work ranges around 87. <laughs> and that's on a good day. And by the way, those little gray things that come in and do the work with you may not be extraterrestrial at all. We have evidence from several abductee reports that that is what they're doing with the sperm and ova that they're taking. They're not hybridizing their race. They're not hybridizing our race. They're making their version of the robotic android machine, and that's why those little things look so darn fetal and why they are programmed. They're like dedicated android or robotic computers made out of us. And that is a possibility.